on June 29, 2023, the Supreme Court decided that Harvard College and University of North Carolina violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment for conducting race-based admissions. Greater disadvantages are believed to be created to the applicants of color. To balance out the negative influences, on July 3rd, activists filed a federal civil rights complaint against Harvard College over legacy admissions with the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights. In this series, we will be in conversations with two education policy professors from Georgetown University to look at the future of racial equity in the U.S. This is 10TV Talk, a platform for conversations that matter. We will be right back. So, uh, hello and welcome to 10 TV Talks. My name is Tina Zhang, Senior Editor at 10 TV. I will be in conversation with Dr. Anthony P. Carnavalli, Research Professor and Director of the Georgetown Youth University Center on Education and Workforce. Today, we will look into the Supreme Court's affirmative action ruling, followed by the lawsuit challenging legacy admissions at Harvard and the long-term influence of these two incidents on U.S. educational law and policy. Welcome again, again Dr. Canavelli. Um, so um, could you just give me a picture about why affirmative actions is so important? Why do we care about it? And uh, why do the activists all have this uh, very uh, significant um, reactions towards this ruling? Well, America is a racist nation. I guess that, that's the essential fact that drives a lot of this on, uh, in, in several respects. Uh, we have a very difficult racial history, barbaric, uh, and there are people uh, who've been trying to do something about that for a very long time. It's always been a struggle. Um, affirmative action, was an idea, uh, race conscious affirmative action was an idea in the Kennedy administration back in the 1960s and then in the Johnson administration and even in the Nixon administration. Uh, and it was an idea that intended to give access to minorities, African Americans, Latinos, indigenous people, American Indians, Hawaiian natives and so on, to elite colleges, which had actively, prior to that, discriminated against those groups. And not only those groups, they discriminated against Jews and Catholics and uh, lots of other people. So in the late 1960s and 70s, when the federal government began supporting those institutions with student aid, the modern Pell Grant or uh, the ever vilified student loans that we have now, that all started then, the federal government began to essentially say to those institutions, you have to do better. Uh, you're going to have to try and help people uh, who are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds of various kinds, one of them being disadvantages that occurred because of racial bias over centuries uh, in the United States. So uh, affirmative action came along. It was uh, in many ways a small thing. Uh, that is, there were relatively few uh, African-Americans, Latinos, and other minority groups who had had sufficient education in the K-12 system to compete for uh, uh, places at elite institutions. And so it's always been relatively small, uh, but very important, uh, if for no other reason than symbolic reasons. That is, we were making an earnest effort to be inclusive in recognition of a long history of racism and other kinds of biases uh, that we were intent on overcoming. What uh, has happened is the benefits of those programs have been 
uh, stellar. Uh, that is, in spite of the fact that a relatively small share of African Americans, Latinos, Indigenous people, a relatively small share of those kinds of students go to elite colleges, nowhere near their current representation in American high schools, for example. Our high schools are increasingly made up of minorities uh, as opposed to white Americans. So opportunity uh, for minorities has become all the more important. So, but what we have done for a very long time now is we have uh, done our best, I think it's fair to say, uh, to provide access to elite colleges for minorities in the United States and uh, the Supreme Court and a very powerful uh, lobby and group of Americans have always been opposed to that. Uh, their reasoning is that if we give any special consideration to race in America, that that is racism. Uh, it's a very odd argument. That is, we're doing it because of our own racism and the history of American racism. So. It's been significant, that is, it has allowed us as a society to make American elites, uh, that is, the people who lead our political system, our uh, businesses and industry structures, uh, all of our institutions have been further integrated by race uh, and by class uh, in the sense that uh, a lot of the minorities who go on to selective colleges are not rich kids. I see. Uh, would you uh, do you think that uh, universities will still work on um, to to figure out a methodology to still maintain the current diversity level at their campus? Are they are will they be trying to do that? I don't know. I know a lot of college presidents on this issue for a variety of reasons in my career. Uh, and first of all, they're scared uh, and intimidated uh, by this. Uh, they don't want to be sued. Um, so my reaction is, I'm not sure. Uh, the court did leave one small opening for them to admit diverse students, and that is the court said that if students in their essay, um, when they uh, apply to a college, they, when you write your essay, which most colleges require you to do, if you can show that the fact that you're a minority has given you a disadvantage in life, um, then you've got a chance at getting in. Now, what that means essentially is everybody's going to have to write an essay saying how hard their life has been. Uh, I find that sort of humiliating. I think it forces minorities to uh, tell ugly stories about their families, their communities, their race. Uh, I think it's uh, bad manners. But in the end, that is the opening. Although in the decision, what they also said was, uh, literally pretty much anything that we deny race conscious affirmative action in particular in this decision we will also deny if it's approached in general so this is not over there's more to come uh, on this issue about racial representation in elite institutions uh, would you say this lawsuit against the legacy admissions at Harvard could, uh, I know the activists claimed that they wanted to offset the negative impacts of the affirmative actions ruling. So would you say that it would be, there would be some chances for it to be, to succeed and it would have some positive impact, impacts on the future for diversities in higher education? There is, we have, um, at Georgetown, in our research center, the Center on Education and the Workforce, uh, we have been involved in this issue for a very long time. Um, we happen to have, uh, among my colleagues, senior experts uh, in 
college admissions. So um, we have tried statistically to figure out if you can use class-based variables like your family income, uh, whether you had somebody in your family die in your, while you're going to high school and that uh, presented hardships for you, but we use family income, your parents' uh, income and education level, whether you're a first-time uh, college student, a variety of other variables that are basically tied to your social class in America. We have not found any of those variables that will come anywhere near replacing the level of diversity we have in our elite institutions now. Um, so we we talked about how um, there is still injustice for even um, people of color who had attended elite universities, but still, why? What, what is the reason for um, for uh, those people of color to um, attend those elite universities? What is the reason for? people of color, the community of ourselves, that we should value so much about our education um, opportunity. Well, there is an argument that the uh, opposition makes, Clarence Thomas, and I don't mean to pick on Clarence Thomas, everybody picks on Clarence Thomas now. It's become fashionable, uh, and mostly I think he deserves it. But anyway, the uh, in the end, um, there is an argument that the court has made consistently, that is the conservative members of the court, that uh, if you allow minority kids or low income kids either to go to elite colleges, they won't graduate. They can't do the work. And all you're doing is disappointing them. That is an absolute falsehood. In fact, the opposite is true. That is the, the reality is that low income and minority kids who go to elite schools have two to three times the earnings gains compared to their parents than the white kids do. That is, the argument the court keeps making is doing something ethical and nice for somebody will only hurt them. Uh, it's not true. Doing something ethical and nice for people who are not advantaged will help them more than anybody else uh, who gets to go to elite schools. Now, we also know that those students and people who get post-secondary education, in many cases, and this is especially true of women, uh, they will end up in jobs. And if you look at the same job among white women, let's say, the white women will make more. So there is a still discrimination on the basis of wages in labor markets. So um, another question is related to that research when I um, also spotted that you mentioned selective universities preference for student athletes. Um, so what do you think about this aspect of the admissions and is there any hope to change it? Well, we know from our own research that if we, if next week, uh, if you took AP tests, test scores, class rank, uh, and we had a couple other things in there, family income, obviously, uh, and uh, you said, okay, from now on, only the kids with the highest academic qualification, the test scores, the class rank, the uh, AP participation, uh, those kinds of variables, and you said, we're going to put all the people with the best academic preparation in the elite colleges. What would happen next week when we enforce that rule is that 65% of the kids in elite colleges would have to leave because they're not there uh, because they have the highest, they meet the highest academic standards. Now, a lot of them are not there because they don't apply. But what you also have is you have legacies. That is, if your mom or your dad went to that college, you get to go uh, in most cases. Uh, and uh, we have donors. If your mom or dad or your uncle Louie, uh, if he contributed to the college, you get to go. Uh, if you're somebody with prestige or power in the community, um, if you're a politician's kid, for example, you get to go. Uh, 
Uh, if you're a good football player, you get to go. Uh, if you can play, I have a nephew who is a trombonist, and a trombone is a very heavy horn to carry around. So because he was such a good trombonist, he got a scholarship to an elite college. They needed a trombonist uh, in the school band. He wasn't the best student in the world. He was just very big and very strong. So, you know, in the end, um, the truth is elite colleges don't admit kids based on merit. Uh, they do to some extent. That is, you're not going to find a high school dropout at Harvard. Uh, and you're not going to find a kid with test scores at the bottom, especially a minority kid, with test scores at the bottom quartile of the uh, test score distribution. You're not going to find them at Harvard. But the notion that this system is entirely merit-based is simply untrue. I mean, it's just, so one of the issues that will come up here, and it already has, uh, is elite colleges have always wanted to be diverse because they're good people uh, running them and because they recognize their mission is to make a better nation uh, and to populate elites with diversity and all those other good reasons. Um, but in the end, uh, for the most part, their reasons for uh, doing this is for prestige. That is, if you're the president of a college, it doesn't matter how much money the college makes uh, because, I mean, it's good to have money. Uh, and if you have a huge endowment, that's prestigious because people know that you're really rich and they like that, especially your board and the alumni. Uh, but if you're an institution um, that is very elite, uh, in the end, uh, these other purposes for admissions are really dominant. That is, your relationship with your alumni, your relationship with the community, and so on. So. One of the things that's about to happen, it's already happening, is in the United States, um, nobody likes elites. Uh, in either the Democratic or the Republican Party, if you go to the, a little to the extremes in either one, um, populist politics, uh, which is the resentment of elites because you think their gains are ill-gotten. You don't think they deserve what they have and so on and so forth. Uh, so what is happening already is there's a lot of anger now focused on elite colleges. That is because they're privileged. And when we look at them as individuals, uh, we say, well, I don't know why that person is so much more privileged than I am just because they went to Harvard. So the politics already uh, in the Congress there are bills being written that prohibit elite colleges for from letting in legacies, the children of the people who went there before. From uh, there's a bill that has a prohibition of against letting in people who contribute to the college. I don't think those bills will pass, but I do think what's going to happen, and maybe relatively soon, is the government is going to demand that the colleges report to the education department how many legacies they're letting in, how many donors, how many people they uh, let in for athletic purposes, and so on and so forth. If for nothing else, it's sort of resentment and revenge uh, against elites, and people, the Republican Party will support that fully. Uh, a lot of Democrats will support that because the colleges no longer are performing a function that creates equality in America over time. And there's resentment about that. That So why don't we, you know, if they've got uh, $40 bazillion in the bank, why don't we tax some of that and use it for lower income kids? I mean, there'll be, there already are, or we'll demand that 30%, 20% is the number that's in the current legis uh, proposed legislation. 20% of the kids have to have Pell Grants. Uh, which is, you know, a lot of schools do that already, but most of the elites don't. So there is a, because uh, Pell Grant is an indication of not being up from a high income family. So uh, this is going to shake up higher education leadership in elite colleges. They are now in a precarious political uh, position.
they can no longer say we're about uh, making a diverse America into a diverse elite because they aren't anymore. Truthfully, they never were. That's the dirty secret. Yeah, I, I'll say I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, it's very good to learn about American history as well, like during this conversation. Um, so um, I think we've uh, almost done with all the questions. Uh, would you say some last words that um, could be anything you expect to happen in the future or um, any just um, last comments about this issue on um, uh, like this admissions ruling. Um, so yeah, just please. I think in a way what we've done is beginning with the Kennedy administration a long, long time ago, um, we became sensitive to the civil rights movement as a nation. We sort of woke up one day and discovered there was racism in America. So it's sometimes looking back hard to believe that people didn't know that but so uh in the kenny administration we started affirmative action not just in colleges but in lots of things uh to try and do something about that because we've been embarrassed at the united nations by the way that's what triggered all that that is there were american civil rights leaders that were going to speaking before the united nations saying america is a racist country and that embarrassed the president so in the end, um, uh, I think what will happen now is that we have to, you can't sweep this under the rug. Uh, there's, there are too many people who care about this and will not let go. Uh, so that in the end, it means there will have to be a continuing reform movement to provide opportunity for minorities and low-income kids. Um, and that will naturally shift uh, to the K-12 system, because in a way, if the courts won't allow you to uh, give openings for uh, lower income kids out of the K-12 education system, then we're gonna have to produce those kids, uh, more of those kids that are disadvantaged or minority who are higher achievers. I think it also shifts the movement towards racial equity, racial justice, uh, to the non-selective institutions. That is, people who care about this are going to have to focus on the non-selective part of the American higher education system, because we're now depending on this to give people college educations or degrees or solid training that get them good jobs. And for the most part, uh, you need a degree to move into an elite class in any industry. It used to be that you could have been a trained roofer and end up president of the roofing company. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, the president of the roofing company is somebody with a four-year college degree or better. So there is a, the focus of reform will shift and we'll see. I mean, that doesn't mean it's gonna be easy uh, it is definitely going to be more difficult because much of what we're talking about are public colleges and universities. Uh, and most American states that tend to fund public colleges and universities uh, tend to defund them. That is state aid for colleges and universities, public colleges and universities. The United States has been going down for 20 years. So, uh, that then suggests, okay, what about the federal government? Well, you can increase Pell Grants, but not enough uh, to get them into the more expensive schools. You can have uh, transparency, which I think is something that's definitely going to happen. That is, uh, we have all the data now after years of pushing against higher education to accept this. We have all the data now at the program level as to what happens to kids who go to college and take a particular program. So we can tell young people now, if you go to this college and you take this program, uh, here's what happened to all the other kids who went to that college and took that program. So we can give more information to young people 
Uh, now, we also need to give them counseling. There is no counseling, career counseling or education counseling in America that's worth a damn. And in order to get it, you're talking about real money, 20, 30 billion dollars. Uh, so to me, that's a, a job for the federal government. Uh, in the end, um, I think that there will be uh, more and more an emphasis on these what are essentially slower, more difficult strategies and that in and of itself. Uh, will be very unsatisfying now that we've taken away. We had this Band-Aid for uh, racism in America. We had, that's what affirmative action really is. We've ripped off the Band-Aid. And now the wound is exposed and it's bleeding. So um, it's an interesting moment. I think the reactions we're going to get are going to be mostly federal. One of the things I do see, and it's already happening, uh, is the Democratic Party, which cares about this, the Republican Party doesn't. I, I don't mean to be partisan, but this this version of the Republican Party celebrates uh, the end of race conscious affirmative action. It was a win for them. Uh, so uh, I think the Democratic Party has already shown uh, what it's going to do, and that is to have a uh, a much all more all systems approach to generating uh, racial justice in America, as well as uh, gender justice, by the way. And that is, you can see it in Biden's program, the one he proposed and got turned down. Uh, and that is, we want to have free preschool for all kids. We want to have I think he wanted to double or triple the funding for K-12 education from the federal government targeted on less advantaged schools. And then what he offered as well is that um, free community college. So there'd be two more years of preparation after high school for all kids. And his notion of that is that he's building a bridge uh, from high school to post-secondary by giving kids two more years to become college or career ready, uh, to give them more time. We know that in the United States, there's not enough time in four years of high school to move the needle uh, on racial justice in the American system. Young people need more education, especially if you're gonna make them both college ready and career ready. So uh, there is um, this systemic approach I think is what uh, the Democrats will come up with. That, of course, is a long-term solution, although you can get busy now trying to raise the money. Uh, and I think you see this in California where the governor is now running on, you know, he's a Democrat and he's running for his reelection on, on a concept called cradle to career. He wants to fund the education system throughout so that we get a, those 30% of kids uh, who had high test scores and really and made it the 70 percent who didn't what he's basically saying is i want to take that 30 percent i want to move that number and the way i'm going to do that uh, increasing kids who are successful throughout the system is to focus on the whole system not just the transition from high school to college all of that is expensive politically difficult uh, most advantaged parents are not going to give up on the quality of their local school and they're going to be damn sure it's higher quality than the less advantaged school down the road. That's human nature. People love their children. So, and if you ask Americans, one of my favorite, I was part of the Clinton administration and we did, we, one of my favorite findings was we did a lot of focus groups to figure out what the public wanted so we could say whatever it was they wanted, so they'd vote for us. Uh, so we asked Americans, do you think your kid needs to go to college? 70% um, said yes. This is back 15, 20 years ago. Uh, we then asked them, do you think other people's kids need to go to college? Almost 70% said no. <laughs> So Americans tend to want college for their own children, but not for other people's children, it's not for them. So I mean, these are fundamental human problems that have to be dealt with. 
Well, thank you so much for sharing, Professor. I do feel like you are super knowledgeable in this on this subject, so it's definitely very、um, meaningful for us to have this conversation, and very meaningful for our colored readers to、uh, know more about the situation and to be hopeful about、um, the changes that could we could look for like in the future. Um, yes. So,、um, thanks for coming to today's Ten Ten TV、Thank、talk.、You. Yeah. Nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you too, Professor. Yeah.